In this lesson, we will talk about what may be the most important strategic approach for the entire quantitative reasoning section, and that's logical estimation and evaluation. So the most important thing to recognize about logical estimation and evaluation is that you want to attempt it at every step of every problem to eliminate impossible choices. And there are a bunch of things that might make a choice possible or impossible based on the structure of the problem. Things like positive versus negatives, evens versus odds, integers versus non-integers, factors versus non-factors, and even something as simple as whether it should be higher or lower. You'll want to consider logical estimation and evaluation as a possible primary tactic for questions if the problem is not seeking a single specific value as its answer. So strategically, you want to consciously note the choices at the beginning of the problem for possible estimation considerations. Are some of the choices integers? Are some of them not? Are some of them positive? Are some of them negative? Are some of them high? Are some of them low? You just want to take stock of all of these things. And this is why we always start by writing out the answer choices if they're simple numbers. Then you can stop and select the correct choice through estimation, as soon as only one answer remains viable, you don't have to keep going. You may see in some of these lessons that we do just to illustrate everything, but very often you'll reach a point in your evaluation where only one answer is left and the exam is designed in such a fashion that it is intended that you choose the right answer as soon as it becomes readily apparent that only one option is viable. You also want to avoid blindly guessing by using logical estimation before you have to guess and mark in under 20 seconds if you cease progressing. And remember back to our overall problem solving approach that you always have to be asking, am I progressing to an answer? And as soon as that answer is no, then you want to estimate, eliminate, guess, mark it, and move on. But you don't want to just guess blindly, try to estimate, even if you are going to make an attempt to return to the problem later using the new feature of the GMAT focus, wherein you can review prior problems and change up to three of your answers. You'll also have some key terms for logical estimation. Things such as proximate or closest to should be big neon signs that say do not fully calculate. So let's take a look at an arithmetic logical estimation example. So Step one, as always, set up the scratch pad, listing your choices vertically, A through E. And we can see that we've got this phrase closest to. So because it's closest to, that's a big neon sign that says don't figure out necessarily exactly what 10 to the fourth minus 9 to the fourth is. Be able to estimate. So 10 to the fourth minus 9 to the fourth is closest to is our question. And we read from the beginning, taking notes and noting logical estimation opportunity to avoid that unnecessary calculations. So 10 to the fourth means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which is 10,000. So it's got to be 10,000 minus something probably a little bit bigger or smaller than 9,000 because that would be 9 times 10 times 10 times 10. So that means that it's not going to be 10,000 minus 9,000. It's going to be 10,000 10, minus something less than 9,000. So we're getting rid of A, B, and C immediately. And if you're just savvy and recognize that, you can get down to a 50-50 shot on something that may be difficult if you're not familiar with how the exam works and how exponential notation works. <clears throat> then we've got 9 to the 4th, which is going to be 9 squared times 9 squared. So 81 times 81. And I'm just going to estimate that as 80 times 80, which would be 6,400. So it's got to be a little bit more than 6,400. But I have to be aware of the trap because it's going to be around 3,600, but it's D because it's the subtraction, not E, which would be if I was too fast, I might accidentally pick that because I figured out what 9 to the 4th was roughly, and I picked what the value of 9 to the 4th was as opposed to 10 to the 4th minus 9 to the 4th. So remember, always write out what the question is asking so you try to avoid those traps that are constantly laid in the exam. Let's take a look at another example, this time a word problem for logical evaluation. So we set up our scratch pad, listing the choices vertically, A through E. And here I'm on the fence as to whether you want to write out these little inequalities. It doesn't take that long to do so, but it's probably not all that hugely beneficial. So just have A through E. But we skip to the end 
and we're being asked for this inexact value of what must be true of A, and we note that there are these inequalities in the choices, not a single numeric value. So that means that I'm not necessarily going to need to solve for one specific value directly. We just need to know what must be true of A. So we read from the beginning, taking notes, while we consider the logical evaluation opportunity. <clears throat> so we list the prime numbers less than 20 because we find if set n is comprised solely by each of the prime numbers less than 20, and the sum of the reciprocals of the terms in set n is a, what must be true of a? So we list the prime numbers less than 20 as 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and 19. And we know the reciprocals are going to be basically one over each of the terms because a reciprocal is what a value times itself would uh, uh, is going to equal to one. So when we're looking at or times the reciprocal will equal to one. So we know that the reciprocal of one half is or the reciprocal of two is one half. The reciprocal of three is one third. The reciprocal of five is one fifth, et cetera, et cetera. So now we've got to work the problem consciously considering logical evaluation as a primary tactic, which means I'm not going to try to find a common denominator of one half, one third, one fifth, all the way up to one nineteenth. That is onerous, is not necessary to do. Instead, there are some common fraction to decimal conversions that we can recognize. And I recognize that one half is 0 0.5, one third is 0 0.3, uh, one fifth is 0 0.2. And if I add just those three up, I'm over one. So because I'm over one at that point, I know that A, B, and C are immediately eliminated. Because I'm like, it's got to be more than one half plus one third plus one fifth, which is greater than one already. Then we've got five terms that are left. And each of them are going to have a value that is less than or equal to one seventh. So that means the remaining sum has to be less than five sevenths, which is less than one. So that means that I'm not going to be able to get all the way up to two. So that means my correct answer has to be choice D. And I did this just logically kind of working my way towards the correct answer without fully technically calculating it because they're not going to expect you, the GMAC, the people who put forth this exam, to find that common denominator. But this is what I like to call an engineer breaker because folks who have a technical math background will generally go directly to that technical solution, even though with the time constraint, it becomes a bit onerous. Don't fall for these engineer breakers. Recognize that because it's asking for this more abstract sort of value of what must be true of A, that's a big neon sign that says, do not fully calculate this. Think about it logically. Determine what the problem is telling you from a whole bunch of different angles. Because again, this is a test of logic and problem solving using the language of math. It is not a math test asking you to solve for the explicitly specific solution because it wasn't necessary here. So let's talk about our process for logical estimation and evaluation. As always, set up the scratch pad listing the choices vertically A through E. You can note if there's large numeric differences or a range in the choices or just an abstract statement or an inexact value. Then you want to skip to the end, label the choices of the sod value. If you've got real numbers, you can put them in there. If you don't, don't write it out. You don't need to include the longer statements or the longer uh, ranges. It's just not necessary. But you do want to note if you're seeking a non-specific value. Then step three, read from the beginning, taking notes and doing needed calculations as you go. Seek time-saving opportunities, though, by not fully calculating as a default. And then step four, work the problem using your chosen tactic until one choice remains viable. And you can eliminate impossible choices as you go to expedite this process at any point on any problem solving question in the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and take a look at how we'll use our scratch work to work through a logical estimation and evaluation process on this exam. So here we have a sample word problem that we might be able to work through logical evaluation. So we set up our scratch work. We don't need to write out the little ratios. You could if you'd like, but it's not absolutely necessary. But we do want to skip to the end, figure out what we're being asked for. We pick up at what, and we see a key term. What will be the approximate ratio of dark chocolate to milk chocolate in the candy bar? So we could just write dark over milk 
equals question mark as a de facto little ratio. So then you want to make sure that you're only noting things algebraically if you're 100% certain of how to do so. If you aren't, just write it as like little English statements. So we start at the beginning. Malik has a milk chocolate that is 30% sugar. So we know milk is 30% sugar. We know that dark is 60% sugar. And we then find that Malik uses only these chocolates to create a candy bar. So we'll say bar. That is 50% sugar. And now we're being asked for that question again of what will be the approximate ratio of dark to milk. We will come back to the technical solution because if you see the technical solution already, you probably are like, hey, I could just do that. But what if you don't? And that's the key thing with, with the logical evaluation versus technical uh, approach in the GMAT problem solving is you've got to be honest with yourself. Don't keep trying to do the algebra if it's not there. You could instead just kind of set up a little matrix here of what's happening to try to literally illustrate what is occurring with the scenario. So we know that if we had a bar that was 100% dark, well, then we'd have 60% that would be sugar. And if we had a bar that was 100% milk, well, then there'd be a 30% of sugar in that bar. Now, this bar that Malik is building is 50% sugar. So just by logic, we can tell that there has to be more dark chocolate than milk chocolate in this bar, because otherwise you wouldn't have your sugar content being closer to the 100% dark chocolate outcome of 60% you'd have it closer to the 30%. So that allows us to eliminate D and E pretty readily. If we're honest with ourselves, we're also probably saying that A is probably way too extreme. Like that percentage of sugar would be a lot closer to 60% if it were a 10 to 1 dark to milk ratio. It's not, so we could probably confidently enough eliminate uh, choice A. And then we're down to B and C. And we can even estimate a little bit more with our matrix because we know that if we're working through the structure that we could just have a constant difference of 10% sugar for each of the intervals. So there's a 10% change here, there's a 10% change here, and a 10% change here. And so what's happening is we need to divide the matrix of 100% one way or the other into thirds as well. So at a 40% sugar bar, we'd have 33% dark to 66% milk, which again makes sense because you've got one part that's going to be dark, two parts that are milk. But if we go to the 50%, which is what we're actually being asked for, we'd again go an additional third of the way in our mixture, and we'd be 66% to 33%. And that's ultimately what we could use to confirm what the outcome is. So we'd have 66 over 33, which would be equal to a two to one ratio. And that allows us to select choice C confidently, but in almost a like more logical approach, just thinking about how a mixture works almost at a theoretical level, as opposed to doing the technical approach. Now, just so you could see how the technical approach would work, because if you were thinking, well, I like doing the technical mixture structure, there's nothing wrong with that. But the algebra, the analogy I like to think about is it's got to be a slam dunk because if you're on a basketball court and somebody passes you or I the ball underneath the basketball hoop, what both you or I is supposed to do is dunk the ball. But I've got a bad foot. I can't dunk. I couldn't dunk when I was younger. But it doesn't mean I can't score. It just means that I can't do it the textbook way. And that's the thing with the algebra is Often and too often, I work with students who they really try the algebra harder, and it's like trying to dunk harder. If you're not tall enough and you aren't able to jump high enough, it doesn't get easier to dunk. Don't get stuck on the algebra. But if you can do the algebra, you might have thought about doing something such as 0.3m plus 0.6d 
is going to be equal to 0.5 of M plus B because it's 30% milk or 30% from the milk, 60% from the dark. It's going to be added up to 50% when you combine the two. So I would just go ahead and get rid of the decimal at the outset. So we now have 3M plus 6D is going to be equal to 5M plus 5D. Distribute that through, subtract out the 3M, subtract out the 3M, subtract out the 5D, subtract out the 5D. We get that D is equal to 2M. And so that means that 2M over M is our ratio because D can be expressed in terms of N. The M's cancel out and we once again have our 2 to 1 ratio. And if you see the technical approach, do the technical approach. But if you don't see it, allow yourself these other approaches, such as logical estimation and evaluation, to really improve your score at the higher end because you don't want to be stuck doing a technical approach if it's not simple and apparent to you in the moment. So go ahead and practice some problem solving drills on your own looking for what is the best approach in the moment, it very well may be logical estimation and evaluation at least a decent amount of the time.